Good evening. Welcome to the 13 Ronarad lecture, and thank you for being here tonight. Ronarad was born on the 5th of May, 1986, in Odesharon. He was a first year chemical student engineer at Technion. And Ron was also a navigator in the Israeli Air Force. In 1986, he flew a mission over Lebanon, during which he was forced to eject from his aircraft. He was then captured by Shia group Amal and was later handed over to Hezbollah. Ron was never to return to his family again. The Technion is one of the world's leading scientific universities, whose Nobel Prize winning research is changing human life worldwide for the better. The Technion and Cornell University jointly open the Technion Cornell Innovation Institute. This partnership was selected by the city of New York as the winner of a competition between the world's top research universities. Last December, the Technion opened a new campus in China. The Technion has always been a center of tolerance and coexistence between Jews and Arabs, secular and religious. Reflecting those values, I am delighted that Dr. Quenta is with us tonight. Last summer, during the Ternion International Board of Governor, Kenta received an honorary fellowship of the Ternion. Her citation reads, in tribute to your tireless work for human rights in the Muslim world and to your rigorous position to radical Islam and to anti-Semitism and with gratitude for your friendship with the State of Israel and the Ternion. Kenta was also invited to meet the Prime Minister Netanyahu in Jerusalem and attended a Knesset discussion on the attempt boycott of Israel. Kenta is a British-born doctor, graduate from Nottingham University, and she practicing sleep disorders medicine in the state of New York. Kenta is currently an associate professor of medicine at the State University of New York. Kenta, among others, is an observant Muslim, human rights activist, outspoken opponent of radical Islam and anti-Semitism, author, journalist, media commentator, and has testified to the US Congress on radical Islam in the United States. Last November, Kenta was invited to Strasbourg to address the Council of Europe at the World Forum on Democracy. For two years, Kanta worked as a physician in Saudi Arabia. Following her stay, she published her book, In the Land of Invisible Woman, sharing her experience of being a female doctor in a fundamentalist Islamic state. The book has been published in 13 countries, and you will find a copy of the book on your dinner table. We are delighted that Kenta accepted our invitation to come to the UK and to speak to a wider audience. Over the past two days, Kenta has spoken to legal and business professionals, hosted by the law firm Howard Kennedy. She lectured to university students, hosted by Imperial College, and 300 senior school students at GFS. Last night, in the Speaker's State Apartment, Kenta spoke to members of the Parliament. It is my pleasure and honor to invite Dr. Kenta to speak to us tonight. Good evening. Thank you, first of all, to Technion UK for this remarkable opportunity over the last two days to meet so many colleagues and so many fellow British citizens to talk about some of the most pressing issues that concern me. Um, when I was preparing for the Ron Arad Memorial Lecture, I also read about Captain Ron Arad. And I noticed um, the year of, um, 
of the events that you've just described, 1986, in which he was uh, downed in his plane and rendered captive, uh, not ever to return to his family. And it made me think about my origins. Um, in this room, uh, you will have met my family of origin. You will uh, meet among some of my uh, oldest and most trusted friends uh, with whom I have uh, developed as a human being and uh, developed as a physician. In 1986, I went to medical school in Nottingham. Um, it was not my decision to, to study medicine. This was a decision that was very important to my father, and I uh, took my father's guidance uh, as, uh, uh, as uh, what I should do. Um, after medical school in 1991, I moved to New York, and that had also been at uh, uh, the encouragement of my father to qualify for the United States medical exams. Again, something that I didn't think was a good idea, but ultimately built a, an entire career in the United States. And, um, and that basis in medicine has actually given me global opportunities so that I've practiced medicine in three continents and I've moved in the most diverse worlds. So if there are any parents here, you can safely tell your children, uh, mommy and daddy often know best. <laughs> because of that uh, foundation in medicine, and uh, the foundation of my values as a Muslim, which came from my parents and continue to come from my parents and my entire family of origin, um, I was very soundly uh, anchored in pluralism and in tolerance and in a rationalist, civil version of Islam. I was anchored with those foundations without actually knowing that that's what they represented. And therefore, when I arrived in Saudi Arabia, a career move that I made um, uh, impulsively, but certainly willingly. I, it was absolutely my choice uh, to go there. I was completely unprepared as a Muslim to encounter a, in, an entirely different manifestation of Islam, a manifestation of Islam that I regard as an innovation, not an authentic experience of Islam. And later, decades later, I would discover that that climate that I lived in, which is uh, widely known as Wahhabi Islam, the uh, quite harsh, uh, rigid fundamentalist theocracy that now exists in Saudi Arabia, is one of the world's leading patrons of Islamism, or what you may have heard about in the media concerning radical Islam. How did I confront that? Much of what I did on a day-to-day -day basis would be like any physician in this room, I, I dressed in a white coat. Uh, I worked at the bedside of critically ill patients. I collaborated with surgeons and physicians. I trained uh, young doctors early in their career. There were no medical schools in Saudi Arabia at the time. Everybody was going to medical school overseas and coming. None of that was unfamiliar. Uh, but what was completely unfamiliar was my uh, limitations simply because of my gender my collision with a society that truly embraces and encompasses apartheid in the form of gender apartheid. That meant that I was not in possession of my legal documents on entry into the country. When you take employment in Saudi Arabia as a physician, uh, the recruiters will come to you in your host country. For me, it was in the United States in New York. And you will sign a contract for employment in New York without seeing your employer or your colleagues or your facility. And you are told some rudimentary information about the kingdom. 15 years ago, there wasn't anywhere near the amount of information about Saudi Arabia that we have commonly today. So it really was a naive uh, behavior on my part to expect that the Islam on which I'd been reared would be functioning in that space. Passing through immigration, I handed my passport over to the officer and I did not receive it back. It went to instead a male uh, Saudi who was representing my employer and functioning legally as a male guardian for an, uh, an unmarried woman entering the Saudi kingdom. That passport stayed in a passport office. And when I wanted to leave the country for a vacation, I had to apply to the Saudi government for an exit visa in order to be able to leave and return to the United States. That is not Islam, but that is a Wahhabi theocracy. It meant that I could take care of patients to the most complex degrees of medicine. I saw some of the most exotic uh, di diseases of my career, brucellosis, uh, tuberculosis presenting as respiratory failure, cerebral malaria, acute tetany, 
um, uh, lightning strikes on individuals, uh, 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 multi-organ multi failure from bites from vipers, uh, Im unimaginable medical complications that I certainly would not have encountered in Nottinghamshire or New York. But despite having all that autonomy in the clinical space, as soon as I left that area, if I wanted to uh, go to a shopping mall which had separate entrances for women and separate entrances for men, if I wanted to eat in a restaurant, I would have to eat in the ladies' section. There were different hours for single men to come there. There was a family section which you could only enter if you were related to the members in your group. Remember, I was one of the first women to be um, hired in the hospital in Riyadh, which was the Saudi Arabian National um, Health Affairs Hospital. It is the healthcare system that supports the Saudi military protecting the Saudi royal family. It has unparalleled resources. Um, most, of, As I was one of the first women to be hired there in a consultant position, all my colleagues were men. Almost everybody that I was teaching was male, and I had no relative or friend in the kingdom. So I realized because of my gender, I was rendered immobile, without autonomy. I did not have freedom of movement. I'm a voracious reader, and I could not bring piles of books into the kingdom. It was not practical. And then I discovered when you go to a bookshop, it's quite appropriate because we're in a library here, um, there were simply identical volumes of a limited set of novels in different bindings. Um, when I ordered 15 years ago, Amazon.com was very new, so I ordered some books from Amazon.com, and I remember they took months. They took 13 weeks to arrive, and I'd ordered three or four hundred dollars worth of reading material and received an empty box with just a calendar left in it because the material had been censored. If you go to get a magazine, then you might find a People magazine there, or you might find a Vogue magazine there. Um, uh, any images of women, the uh, arms would be blacked out, text would be blacked out. This was the responsibility of the shopkeeper who could be punished if he did not sell magazines in appropriately censored manner. I remember we hung on and reread precious copies of magazines in nail salons and hairdressers that women stored, and even though we'd read them, we'd read them again and again. It was culturally so depriving after I left Saudi Arabia, I actually moved to London, um, in, in, uh, to um, South Kensington, and I subscribed to every magazine and newspaper and went alone to the cinema every weekend to see everything. It was like gorging on cultural and uh, intellectual material because there was such a desert. The one place in Saudi Arabia uh, where I, I uh, in fact, ironically found myself um, identifying and locating my place within Islam happened in Mecca. And just like my decision to move to uh, the United States was in fact not a calculated one, it was a, a, a reflexive one. My decision to move to Saudi Arabia was an impulsive and, and uh, urgent one, not well thought out. Similarly, there was a strange event that um, transpired that led me to Mecca. You may well know that one of the pillars of Islam for believing Muslims is to perform a pilgrimage in Mecca, to Mecca, if you are of adequate health and if you are of adequate means with what we term halal money, that is mean fair gotten gains, not ill gotten gains. And so I had never in my life had a conversation about going to Mecca. Uh, some of my older relatives had uh, gone to Mecca, uh, but it had not been something that had been a priority for me. I don't think I'd ever talked to my family about it. But uh, one day we were taking care of a desperately ill 16-year-old in the medical intensive care unit and managed to revive uh, this young girl. And after we succeeded, two or three of us physicians were standing and having a cup of tea to recuperate. And one of them said, you know, you really should go to Mecca. The season for going to Mecca was approaching and we'd been discussing who would be looking after the patients while we were traveling. And Nobody can prevent you from going to Mecca. This is your right as a Muslim, and you might never get another chance to go. And this, this, this was the most I'd ever heard out of my quite austere and religious Muslim colleague who was also from uh, Pakistan. So uh, somehow his words had an impact on me. And I thought, well, how does one go to Mecca? I can't even, I can't even get, go in a car to the mall without making complicated arrangements. 
and uh, the hospital had a travel office and I went to the lady in the travel office and I said, you know, I'd like to go and uh, go to the pilgrimage, which was about eight days away. <laughs> People prepare decades to go to the pilgrimage. So uh, after she had finished uh, praising God with, the, you know, how joyous this news was, she finally got down to the practicalities and I, I gave her some money and she assured me that on uh, the following weekend I would be on my way. <laughs> so I... I I told some of my Saudi colleagues, not, we've talked a lot about Saudi Arabia in the last few days, but many of them were very, very happy. They brought me little books of prayers that were translated in English. Uh, they uh, wished me well. They gave me whatever advice they could. These are my, my male military physicians that I'm uh, training. And um, I get ready, and on the morning that I'm supposed to go, they told me to wait for a particular taxi at 8.30 in the morning, and I was standing in this godforsaken part of our compound waiting to see whether the driver would come. There was no sign of the driver. And then finally somebody rolled up, and they had documents, and I got a plane ticket that I still remember now was written in pencil. And I thought, this is never going to get me. This is never going to get me to Mecca, but I went along with it. The woman in the car with me, Muslim women are supposed to go with a male relative, a brother, a father, a son, a husband. But some Muslim women don't have that uh, available. So I was uh, to join a group of uh, women uh, doing the Hajj uh, with a special uh, priest or a special imam. So the woman with me was from New Jersey and not very friendly. And immediately that I met her, I thought, we are not going to get along. And when a Muslim goes to ha Hajj, you have a requirement never to lose your temper and to be accommodating and to be nice. And I thought, it's already, it's already started. And somehow with this path, I found myself at the airport in Riyadh with the way I, with the way I can still see it in my mind is an entirely biblical scene. If you ask Steven Spielberg to cast going to Hajj, this is what I would see. I had brought a little carry-on, a little, uh, a couple of uh, t-shirts and trousers and my, uh, my mandated veil. And people came as if they were leaving this world with every possession, with enormous packages uh, that were somehow all getting on the plane. There seemed to be no size requirement. Uh, and people were from all manner of walks in life. All of the men coming to the airport were dressed in the traditional Islamic dress, which is two pieces of white cloth without any zippers. They have to be secured just you know, by themselves. And these cloths eventually can become the shrouds of Muslims when they pass away. Because the idea of going to Mecca is confronting your maker in this life. So I felt very out of my depth and wondered what I had got myself uh, into. And um, I found myself in a group of 60 mostly uh, Saudi families uh, that I was with for about nine days as we went through all of the rites of uh, the Hajj, about which, again, I had known nothing. I had little books with arrows and diagrams, but really I just followed my group and made my uh, passage there. And I remember there, there were some very profound moments in a pilgrimage, which I had braced myself for because I told myself, I am a physician, I have a scientific mind, I'm not going to be... Uh, subsumed by group psychology. I'm not going to be caught up in the fervor of uneducated masses. I'm just going to do the rituals and hopefully this will be a beneficial thing. And in the first moments that I entered uh, the, the mosque, the scale of which is quite astonishing, each level of the mosque in the years that I went there would have a capacity of 750,000 people. The mosque is three stories high. As you know, in Islam, there are prayers uh, five times a day that are required. Um, the greatest thing about Hajj, I found, was that the prayers are very abbreviated because you are a traveling uh, pilgrim in hardship. So I was very glad to find out that they're significantly shorter than when you're not on Hajj. So each time as you are approaching, it might be a different prayer time, and you stop and then... I found myself praying even on the Tom Academy along with hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, it was quite astonishing, but as I entered, uh, entering the mosque where there were low steps 
rather like the one I'm standing on, and then moving to, uh, ahead towards the Kaaba, which is the 49-foot square building that Abraham built, Muslims believe, and uh, represents the house of God. It is not an object of worship. It's a place of reverence, and it is where Muslims think is great proximity to God if we want to meet him in this in this lifetime. And as I looked up, the crowd was slowing down, and I thought, I wonder what the delay is. Let's get this over. Not really understanding the scale of the, the group, the crowds that I was in. And uh, my eye, uh, eye line raised up to see why we could not move. And at that point, instead of seeing the obstruction, which was just many human beings trying to go in the same direction, I saw the... I saw the uh, Kaaba, it was evening, it was dusk. The Kaaba is covered in a black cloth, which is called the Kiswa. It weighs about a 640 kilograms, and it was billowing in the breeze, which gives an impression that the building is somehow alive, even though we as Muslims offer worship only to our creator, not to any object or not to any building. And in, in that moment, I made a connection with my maker that I carry with me, me still. The irony being that I was in one of the most intolerant societies in terms of the uh, punitive nature with which a version of Islam is imposed on Muslims and non-Muslims. And yet in that place, the epicenter of Islam was where I felt an intimacy, a connection, a forgiveness, a, an acceptance. Later that night, I decided to make, there are circumambulations. If you make them closer to the Kaaba, they're a lot shorter, but the crowds are very intense. Crowd density can be up to uh, seven to nine people in a square meter, which becomes a high risk of stampede. So if you take an outer route, the circuits are 0 0.9, 0 0.8 kilometers in uh, dimension. So it could take you an hour to make a circuit but it's much more easy to move. And I, at one point making the circuit on the roof that night, again, it was time to pray. Again, the massive crowds came to a halt. And again, everybody offered prayer. Muslims pray towards the Kaaba. They pray towards the house of God. And there I found myself in a circle of 750,000 people, all of us looking towards each other as we were in worship. And in that crowd, as I stood there, I could see faces that very much look like the faces that are looking at me now. All ethnicities, all races, all ages, all languages. I could hear Hausa, I could hear Arabic, I could hear Punjabi, I could hear English, I could hear people that sounded like they were from Brooklyn, I could hear Afrikaans. That's where I felt I have found my place in Islam. I left the pilgrimage, uh, at the end of the pilgrimage, and I return to my workplace, and I return immediately to a very abrupt reintroduction to day-to-day -day life in Saudi Arabia. And that divorce, the divorce between the Islam that I, that I was reared on here in Britain from my family of origin and the Islam that operates in the public space in Saudi Arabia, the divorce from that inclusion and that diversity and that equality, when you look at a crowd at the Hajj, you yourself, if you are observing Hajj, if you're a man or a woman, are not permitted to wear any jewelry. You can wear an eyeglass if you need it to see. You cannot wear any item that distinguishes you from another individual. And I realized this pluralism, this diversity is how our maker sees us. And it was almost like seeing our fellow human beings as the way our maker had intended us to, without distinction. So even though I had to travel to one of the most repressive environments imposed by, uh, uh, they are Muslims, by Muslims who practice an austere and what I think is, a, is a, an artificial uh, manifestation of Islam, I was at least able to carry with me the true essence of Islam, which does embrace racial diversity, ethnic diversity, economic diversity, demographic equality. And Muslims are told, 
of course, there are reasons for the Hajj to retrace the steps of uh, the, the, the Prophet, to retrace trace the steps of Abraham. There are many uh, symbolisms in the journeys that we make. But another major message of the Hajj is for the Muslim to understand. Once they leave the space of the Hajj, they must conduct themselves in the same manner as they did at Hajj. It's always remarkable that we do not have more disasters and more calamities. We had a very unfortunate year recently at the Hajj, but given the sheer number, three to four million people performing that right at the same time in a city that normally has a population of around 80,000 uh, when the season is over, tens of millions of people coming to the Hajj for that period, the only way that can really succeed is not just with engineering and good health care and excellent signs, it's with individuals cooperating with one another, even when they don't have a shared language or they don't have shared values. Another component of that is, I, n number one, I felt acceptance in Islam there. Number two, I was not initially accepted by my group of Muslim pilgrims in which I found myself. The first time I prayed inside our ladies' tent, we stayed in, in different tents that you may have seen on television. Um, while I was praying, I, I heard all these terrible calls, haram, haram, which means uh, treif, uh, means absolutely something terrible is happening. And I'm trying to speed up my prayer so I can find out what terrible thing is happening. Let me get this over and done with until I realized the terrible thing was me. I was praying inside the ladies' section, but I did not keep on my abaya, so the Saudi women with me felt it was terrible that I was wearing trousers because my maker you know, would be offended by this outline. Um, I was a haram because I did not cover my ears when I was praying. Uh, there were all these uh, problems they had with my method of observation. Um, that was very intimidating. Later in the night, I was woken up uh, in the tent where I slept uh, on, on, on the floor with a little mat. And I thought, oh, this must be another prayer that I don't know anything about and I better get up and do it. But instead, I was ushered by women who didn't speak English uh, through the uh, very uh, the dead of the night, through the complex of thousands of tents to another place where there was a woman in distress and I realized that they needed a physician and I assisted the patient. She had some medication and I dispensed the medication to her. And after I did that, the entire group of Saudi women became my protectors and my allies because they valued me simply because I was a Muslim, even if my rituals seemed rather aberrant and, uh, er and erroneous to them. That had won them respect. And I think Tonight I'm here, even though I've, obviously I'm a Muslim, I observe, uh, I observe Islam, I am from a Muslim family who are supporting me in every way, through every public engagement and every publication, um, I am representing tonight an Israeli university. And I think when I, I have never uh, made this connection before, so this is really coming to mind now, but when I travel to Israel and I go to a hospital in Israel or I go to a university in Israel, I see a similar ethnic and racial and demographic diversity, a similar pluralism. There is a similar, um, uh, less so, but there are similar unfamiliarities with people's religious observations, rather like people were unfamiliar with me. And I also see how endeavoring in the field of science and the field of technology and medicine, those are disciplines that are incredibly demanding and consuming can alleviate and eliminate barriers which don't seem to be overcome in other places. There's a very specific reason why I have become an advocate for Technion. I know some of you are alumni of the Technion Institute. If anyone doesn't know about the Technion, the Technion Israel Institute for Science and Technology, it was founded at the beginning of the 20th century. I think it first took students in, uh, 19, in the 1920s or so. The ground was, uh, uh, the foundation was uh, in inception in about 1911. There are 12,800 or so students studying over 83 different disciplines, 53 different academic institutions. We're delighted to have a Technion campus that competed with universities globally, over 50 competitors to have a, a partnership with Cornell um, on a campus that was donated by Mayor Bloomberg 
Um, and Technion was the university that won that uh, collaboration. And Technion has now uh, become the first uh, univer Israeli university to partner in China with a new province, a new campus already being built in Guangdong in China and Chinese citizens already studying for their first Technion degrees. So this is a, this is a, this is a university that comes from a very small city and a nation that is geographically small and small in number but has a global reach and influence. The reason I became an advocate for it was I recognize that all of my freedoms, my freedoms of thought, my freedoms of movement, my ability to, to be financially independent, to generate and hold wealth, my ability to be able to communicate with an orthodox Wahhabi religious cleric who would willingly accept my medical care, or an orthodox Bengali East London Muslim, or an orthodox um, Haredim lady in New York, has all come from the incredibly powerful education that I had Number one, with my family of origin, and number two, in the discipline of medicine, which I first entered here in Britain. The second reason that I'm an advocate for, te for the Technion is that kind of freedom to study and freedom to share education, that kind of freedom to collaborate with scientists from every university in all disciplines, is currently actively being threatened at an international level by movements that seek to boycott institutions like the Technion. And later we will have time to talk and we can talk about that in detail. This came to my attention because of articles published here in a very respected medical journal called The Lancet in which I interpreted the opinion that was offered and endorsed by the journal to be explicitly anti-Semitic and explicitly seditious, holding responsible all Israeli scientists and all Israeli uh, physicians as uh, potentially genocidaires of the Palestinian people. I found this indigestible, unacceptable, and I have been in other Israeli institutions and spoken to Israeli professors of medicine who've appealed to me to help in philanthropy so that they could pay salaries to Palestinian Muslim doctors for advancing their higher education. This was such a fallacy, which I saw printed in some of the most esteemed pages to come into the world of medicine, that I was personally affronted and horrified. Because if we lose the morality of physician minds, we're here in the Royal College of Physicians, if we lose the perspective of physicians who are required, we take an oath to treat each individual equally, irrespective of our bias, each patient that comes to us for assistance deserves the best possible care, whether society has deemed them to be a felon or whether there is some other aspect of their life that doesn't uh, match the values that we might have as physicians. If we have physicians advocating for the boycott of institutions like the Technion, where Technion students in Israel represent, they represent at a minimum the same demographic percentage of minorities, that means non-Jews, Arab Muslims, the predominant group, Arab Christians and Arab Druze, are at the very least 20% of Technion's population, and the national percentage is very similar in Israel. But in the school of medicine that I visited, 38% were Arab uh, origin, meaning Israeli citizens who are not Jewish, Israeli citizens who are ethnically Palestinian. If we begin to narrow the spaces for organizations like that, if we in privileged societies like Britain or the United States decide that we will ban engagement, we will deny research funds, we will excommunicate colleagues and take away their opportunities to be keynote speakers, to have international uh, uh, visas uh, to, be tra to be traveling, to be not allowed to be present in part of a scientific academe. If that becomes the mainstay position, then that threatens not only an Israeli institution, it threatens the intellectual abilities and empowerments of the sectors in societies that are dealing with complicated problems, that are best able to create engagement, best able to overcome political conflict, and best able to build parallel nations if that's what Israelis and Palestinians decide to do. The reason I feel strongly about that as a physician 
And I don't have any uh, research endeavors at the Technion, though currently I am training an American in sleep disorders medicine. He'll become a sleep specialist in June, and he's a graduate of the Technion Medical School. So there's a lovely connection, but that's the first time that has happened. Um, when I think about the responsibility of being a physician with morality, I think very much about uh, a time in history when physicians abrogated all their morality. When I prepared to write an argument in return uh, to The Lancet, why this was egregiously unacademic, why the academic space internationally, whether in theory or in principle, in abstract or in print, should remain um, apolitical. Uh, when, I, when I was preparing those arguments, I read about the history of the persecution of Jewish doctors uh, in the rising uh, Nazi society. I read about the, uh, uh, the time, and it was in, in August, if I think I remember it correctly, it may have been August 1933, I did not read this immediately before coming here tonight, where there was an announcement in, uh, in Germany that from now on all Jewish doctors would be stripped of their license to practice, but they would be allowed to treat their family members. The world was silent. That announcement happened to be published in The Lancet about 75 years before I was objecting to the paper that would label Israeli scientists and physicians as genocidaires. I had to put that observation um, also and file it in my brain where I knew that there could never have been a Holocaust without the participation, collaboration, and organization afforded to uh, uh, the Nazi political leadership by the machine of German Medical Academy. There was a disproportionate number of German physicians who had memberships in the SS party. Once we lose our academic integrity, all kinds of horrific ideas can take place unless we defend that academic integrity. And the final reason I became an arbiter for the Technion is because I did think about my time in Saudi Arabia where I could not drive, I could not leave and suddenly go on vacation one weekend. Um, I was harassed uh, by a religious police because I was alone or because I was um, uh, eating when I was not praying or because I was, uh, my scarf had fallen off. Um, uh, the other reason I, I feel about that when I was denied all the freedoms that I am used to, uh, the only freedom I did enjoy was academic freedom. I was still able to, and in fact, because there was very little else to do in the kingdom, published prolifically in my field and ultimately became an expert on health at the Hajj. And I was able to do that freely with my American mentors who by chance happened to be Jewish. I was not denied that academic space. In all the years that I lived in Saudi Arabia and for the subsequent 10 years I traveled back and forth and taught in different academic conferences there, nobody once called to boycott the Saudi kingdom for its limitations on women. Never mind privileged women like me who were physicians there, but women who maybe did not have a medical career, had lost their fathers, were widowed, did not have a son. Those women are completely at the mercy of elements or the hardships that many men in Saudi Arabia face for uh, very harsh rulings that they might confront. Nobody had appealed for that. And so I think it's only the morally um, authentic and um, principled thing to stand up to op oppose uh, academic and cultural boycott of an institution like the Technion and it's particularly essential at times like now, where we have critical hostilities in terms of wars and conflicts, growing polarization in the United States that you see daily, growing xenophobic attacks against, uh, uh, against Jews in terms of anti-Semitism. And I learned from the representative of the Israeli ambassador last night, growing attacks of xenophobia on Muslims. In this climate, the only hope for us weathering these kinds of hostilities is if the intelligentsia is able to engage and communicate with one another. And at the moment, there are many forces that seek to cut off exactly this kind of dialogue. 
The forces that would seek to cut off this dialogue that we're having tonight are those that would say affiliating with an Israeli institution, they would say to me, is the height of enmity towards the Palestinian people. Or to bring to mind shortcomings that Muslim majority countries have, shortcomings being a very kind and generous way to expose them is somehow to be an enemy of Islam. When I know from my family and my religion that the very bare requirement, the bare minimum that I've been talking about in the last couple of days to be a Muslim is to expose any injustice if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says to the Muslim, if you see any injustice, if you've witnessed it, you have a responsibility to put a stop to it. If you are able to and capable, you may put a stop to it with your hand. But maybe you're not. Maybe you're not physically capable. Maybe you are physically vulnerable. If you can't put a stop to it with your hand, you must put a stop to it with your voice. Fortunately, I have been given a voice. If you're not able to put it, stop to it with your voice, maybe you lack a voice, or engaging your voice would be too dangerous, then you must at least register that, register that injustice in your heart. And I think, therefore, when I see my fellow academicians, people as educated as me, harboring and promoting and subscribing to views, very militant views to boycott one nation in particular, one people in particular, indiscriminate, not understanding that that nation is providing shelter to many minority religions, which don't, do not have shelter in the region anywhere. One of the only countries to offer shelter to Christians in the Middle East is Israel. One of the only countries in the Middle East to offer shelter to the minority Ahmadi Muslims is Israel. One of the only countries in the Middle East to offer shelter to people who decide they are choosing or they, they, are, they are not even choosing, they are biologically uh, committed to an alternative lifestyle is Israel. To me, that's a grave injustice. And also to silence a particular racial and ethnic group that may have valuable things to share is also an injustice. And I think therefore it's completely compatible for me, even though I'm not a graduate of the Technion, I'm not an alumnus of the Technion, I'm not appointed at the Technion, to be an advocate simply because of the privileges I've enjoyed in my edu education and the global travels I've seen where I have witnessed religious persecution and I have experienced true forms of apartheid in a way that I hope others don't have to be subjected to. I'm very keen to hear if we have time and I, I don't have a clock, um, your remarks, I'm available all evening to answer any questions to my ability, and I very much thank you for being so engaged this evening and for, and for supporting the Technion. I'm very much grateful for you for supporting the Technion and supporting my colleagues there. Thank you for that brilliant, brilliant talk. I was just curious to know, if you wrote to The Lancet, have you had a response? Yes, I wrote to The Lancet, um, and there's quite a story to that. I wrote to The Re Lancet, like many things I did, reluctantly, because I first suggested that Peretz Levy, the president of the Technion, should formulate a response. And his response to me was, if you write one, we'll join you. So I wrote a 1900 word argument. I took their article and I deconstructed it rather like you would a political paper. And I constructed an argument and I said, see what you think. And he asked me, do I mind if he could share it with some faculty members? And then he came back and said, three of my faculty would like to collaborate with you on the paper and support your statements and make, uh, become co-authors. And by the way, they all are Nobel laureates. Then there was the Nobel laureates talked to each other. There was a fourth Nobel laureate from the United States who also wanted to be a participant. Uh, Daniel Zeifman, who was the president of Weissman Institute, uh, became involved and also the president of the IDC, Uriel Reichman. Um, so we sent this. It was an intelligent argument in my opinion, but also in the opinion of these great minds. And we had this extraordinary um, author list in which I'm not counting myself. And that was stonewalled from The Lancet for two weeks. Now, I, I rarely submit a paper that does not, we would like to publish it, but there are these things wrong with it. it and I have been published in The Lancet on a number of occasions, so they, I was known to them. 
So I was surprised at the silence. And in my brain, I have this uh, fantasy that if I imagine something and I really, really want it to happen, I can will it. So I remembered the date in which Jewish doctors were denied the license to practice medicine in Germany uh, in August. And I thought, by this date, I want this in this, this magazine, even though that's magical thinking in this journal. Um, after two weeks, I received a, a point-blank rejection. There was no explanation. And um, my fellow colleagues, including uh, a, te a Technion giant, Aaron Chikonova, were just aghast. But at the same time, credit to the president of the Technion, while this was going on, there were some patrons of the Technion, rather like influential supporters like yourselves, who were uh, traveling to Israel at the time and learned of the incident. And one of them um, um, decided that if the document was not going to be published in academic columns, it could well be published in a much wider mainstream audience. And I think this was communicated to the journal. At the same time, the presidents of these several universities were communicating directly with the, with the publication. And a couple of days later, I received an email from the same editor saying, we're delighted to accept your paper with no modifications. And I thought, this journal does not know what it's doing. It had no basis to reject. And now after rejecting, suddenly you can accept. And I interpreted that as they felt that they had made an error in not publishing this view. And um, to me, uh, for me, that, that was not my most wet, read publication. There was no CNN appearance that was triggered by that publication. Um, it is actually defined as a letter. It's not even defined as a peer-reviewed publication on my curriculum vitae. But to me, that was one of the most important pieces of writing that I had to do. And everyone here has the ability to do exactly that. I, I think that many of the students I've met with, 300 students uh, today who were who are studying at Europe's largest school, uh, largest Jewish school uh, called JFS. And today, these uh, six formers are beginning to get ready to go to university. And one of the things I try and tell every audience is even if you think you don't have a voice, you do have one. There's nothing remarkable about why I'm here. It's only because there have been many opportunities where I've insisted on being heard. Ironically, my book being entitled In the Land of Invisible Women, which, which was not mine, some of my friends like to joke that welcome to the land of visible women. And I think that there is something absolutely imperative that in all the spaces in which you move, they may be political, they may be medical, they may be philanthropic, they may overlap, they may be in the business world or commercial world, you have an unbelievable opportunity to be ambassadors for people that really are voiceless. If you're an undergraduate at the Technion, you might be the first Arab woman from your village in Israel that has gone to higher education. If you're a young uh, 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 chemical engineering student, you might just have come out of serving in the IDF and you're struggling with, uh, with your classes. Um, if you are running a research lab, you are trying to help your staff get funding to continue your research lab. They don't have the same opportunities that you and I have because they have different responsibilities and they also don't have a sense of how militant the climate to boycott academic institutions and cultural institutions is becoming. And when I see that climate, I've, I've confronted it in the United States. I was very relieved to see that it didn't happen at Imperial College, where I'm told it's a very tolerant environment, but I was still prepared for opposition. Um, when I encounter uh, uh, politically mili militant individuals at a privileged university in New Jersey, who, want, who did in fact silence my remarks and claim that I was Islamophobic and uh, claim that I was an instrument of Zionism and that I was uh, supporting uh, uh, co supremacist colonialism, they have no contact with the worlds in which I've had contact or you've had contact. It's not excusing their ignorance, but they have a kind of rabid righteousness which can only be birthed from ignorance. And that is going to take monumental education and effort to overcome. But I do believe pluralism and coexistence is going to triumph. And I don't just mean that in the con context of Israel and Palestine. I mean, that, I mean that internationally and I mean that metaphorically. The Quran itself says we have created among you nations and tribes so that you may know each other. 
if we were supposed to be the same or if we were supposed to be one tribe at the expense of another, that would not meet the criteria for the divine experiment all of us have been given. So, yes, the letter was published in The Lancet. <laughs> Professor Siegel. We are living through a very serious threat from Islam uh, globally as a result of globalization and something that the superpowers are really unable to deal with. And it's, and it's becoming progressive and it's becoming more and more dangerous, especially as, for example, some of the countries like Pakistan have nuclear warheads and so on. So what would your suggestion as to be a remedy be? So Rather than simply just we should be friendly with each right. other. I no. mean, realistically, how yeah. do you think we can address it? So, le so let's be clear. I agree with uh, your remark in uh, general. I would say that we're facing international threats um, uh, which are in some ways uh, similar and some ways different at the hands of Islamism. Islamism, also casually known as radical Islam, is not Islam. Islamism wants to be mistaken for Islam and wants to be an imposter of Islam and steals language and metaphors and images from Islam. But Islamism is explicitly totalitarian. Is it, ex is it, it is explicit, explicitly supremacist. And important for this audience, it is express, explicitly naming as a central principle a lethal and genocidal anti-Semitism. We are confronting that, and we have confronted it um, where in all the places I've lived, um, in both sides of the Atlantic, Israel has had a particularly intimate acquaintance with Islamism, rather like Pakistan has, um, in terms of the scale and number of deaths in, with martyrdom ideology. Um, I think partly, I, I think Islamism is winning in many ways. It's winning because you refer to superpowers. The leaders of superpowers are human beings, and they have proven to be exceptionally inept in recognizing and exposing this threat. I can speak particularly of the United States in that regard. The United States often now admits that they went into an Iraq war invasion, not knowing the difference between a Shia and a Sunni. And they have now gone to war reluctantly and half-heartedly with ISIS, not knowing the difference between Islam and Islamism. So we are at, at, the, peril and, at the peril and mercy of international leaders who frequently lack deep political science understanding against a theological context. That's not their fault. That's just a reality. I think also Islamism and its... It's already at work here in Britain, and I, I heard about it from some people in the reception, uh, but I've seen it, and uh, one of the most uh, striking examples of it was the Charlie Hebdo attacks, is the concept of blasphemy. It's not a, it's not a concept unique to Islam, though Islam and the Quran itself particularly mentions if blasphemy is a crime, it is a crime to be prosecuted not between mortals, but a crime that a mortal will answer when he meets his maker. But the concept of blasphemy as it relates to Islamism today has actually silenced conversations, intimidated the media, made some ideas difficult to publish or impossible to endorse, and that is extremely dangerous in liberal democracies. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, I've mentioned to you that I have had talks which were not as, um, uh, which were much more focused than this talk, specifically about Islamist ideology and its penalties on freedom of individuals, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. And I have been attacked as an Islamophobe, which has a goal not to hurt my feelings, but a goal to render me so marginal of a voice that I will no longer have platforms or no longer have credibility. That is the goal of Islamophobia. In the United States, where I watch it more closely, we have failed at identifying Islamism. We have failed at acknowledging what Islamophobia really is. And that doesn't mean that I'm denying that there are xenophobic attacks on places of Muslim worship, just as there are, I know that there are anti-Semitic attacks on images and, and bodies of Jewish uh, people and Jewish faith.
But Islamophobia, as it's understood, is a modern construct. Nowhere in the history of Islam will you read that any early Muslim, any major figure in Islam was ever worried or silenced because of a loathing or, uh, or, a, or a fear of Islam. That does not appear in the first uh, 14 to 15 millennia, uh, 14 to 15 centuries of Islam. But Islamophobia today is almost better, more widely used than Islamism. Do I think there's a remedy? I think the remedy, the remedy fortunately and unfortunately lies within Islam. So what you're referring to actually is how Islamism has assaulted us as international populations, meaning we've had terrorism here in London, we've had terrorism in New York, we've had ter terrorism in Paris, um, you've had terrorism in, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. I mean, we can name any location, Karachi, Peshawar, it's been everywhere. But the real conflict is actually the one that's writhing within Islam itself. And in Islam, Islamism, neo-orthodoxy, neo-fundamentalism is certainly winning. You worry about Pakistan's nuclear warheads. We in Pakistan worry about them too, but we also worry about Iran's incredible, not their nuclear program to be, but their incredible reach and authority, even though they're an explicitly Islamist pseudo-democracy. I have spent eight years watching President Obama work towards a rapprochement with Iran. Never was its Islamist principles acknowledged, never mind by the president, even by his most hostile critics in the media, this does not come up. How does Iran's political ideology of Islamism, which is not Islamic, it is absolutely foundationally un-Islamic to impose belief or observation on a human being. That's, we're given that in the Quran. There's no challenge to a maker if you just subjugate every, all your created objects to believe you. Where's the challenge? The challenge for the maker is to see if his, if his creation will willingly engage and worship and adore him. One would imagine if one was a creator. I'm speculating as a mortal. But countries like, like Iran, openly Islamist, and read about Islamist in any political science work, Islamism, countries like Pakistan that were founded by Muslim minorities, uh, M. A. Jinnah, the founder of uh, Pakistan, was originally uh, was himself a Shia, British trained lawyer, a Shia, which is a minority Muslim, married to a Zoroastrian woman from India. Those two minorities are heavily persecuted in Pakistan now. The founder of Pakistan would not find a place to safely worship or be. They're not just exotic countries far away where there is upheaval and there is induction into child uh, jihadism. They are countries who sit in powerful organizations called the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Conferences, where they dominate the political and global positions as representatives of the Muslim world and intimidate the United Nations until, into passing resolutions that seek to criminalize what they define as Islamophobia. That has one goal only, and their goal is really clear. They want to make criticism or scrutiny of what they determine to be Islam, which we as Muslims know is Islamism. They want to criminalize that into a human rights violation. And you can read about that extensively in literature on, on UN res resolutions related to that. So how does something that's happening at the United Nations affect us? Because we have ancient democracies here in Britain and a mature democracy in, in the United States. It limits what we think is acceptable conversation, acceptable dialogue, acceptable intellectual positions to hold, and it has the effect of confining even pluralistic democracies. That's why, irrespective of what you thought the content of Charlie Hebdo was, which I never even saw until well after the event happened, and when I did come across it, I found it uniformly obscene, no matter what they were depicting, but that's why some publishers will now refuse to publish certain items, whether or not we agree with them. One of the consequences of living in a secular plural society is profanity. It doesn't mean that we enjoy or partake in profanity, but we tolerate profanity in our societies as much as we tolerate divinity and the sacred. So this battle within Islam 
This battle between Islamism and civil rationalist Islam is winning already a war of blasphemy. We don't have to be told that things are unlawful or penalized by capital crimes to say them in this country, but we're already shying away from important things. Islam doesn't require Islamophobia. Islam has no shame in being scrutinized. Islam has been, is become one of the most, and through history, one of the most uh, populated religions. By 2020, one in four human beings on the planet will be Muslim. The fastest growing sport in the Muslim world is, is football. Some of the, the biggest numbers of football fans are Muslim. I mean, it's really an, an enormous group of individuals. And yet Islamists have hold of ideas, of values, of an invented Sharia, another tenant of Islamism, not a principle of Islam, which intimidates and capitulates whole populations. And when we in the West include them and engage with them as international partners, we are only strengthening Islamism. So the tip of the iceberg that makes the news is really the conflict with violent Islamism, the uh, attack on some journalists, a uh, car bomb in Ankara. That's really what makes the news. What has not made the news for 15 years, and in fact for a century leading up to it, is the danger and threat of Islamism. But if you go to... Uh, 2015, January, and read the speech of President Sisi of Egypt, who confronted Al-Azhar University in Cairo, the seat of Sunni intellectual thought, and very passionately talked to the Sunni clerics and begged them to begin confronting the deviant ideology that is emerging from within, within us, or we will lose, we will lose enormously uh, as Muslims. Uh, that speech gives you an idea of the gravity of the problem. As to the remedy, I'm not sure if there is a remedy. Earlier on, uh, at some other engagement, people asked me if I was uh, optimistic. or I don't feel particularly optimistic. And I sense that because something is changing, at least in the Western world that I encounter. There is more fear. There is more xenophobia. There is, there is true xenophobia of the foreign or the other. There is more fragmentation. There is less community. There is increasing disparity in wealth in the United States that now matches, exceeds the gilded age. That, that's a quite well-known fact. Our societies are becoming so fragmented. And when I encounter audiences that are, that are younger than I am, significantly younger, I find that people don't understand the basic principles of uh, secular or liberal democracy. People that are born in the United States don't understand what democracy really is. If you don't understand what democracy really is, you can't shelter or shield it, and you certainly can't protect it from being intimidated by Islamist-driven claims of Islamophobia. That does not mean that I would not defend a Muslim institution or person from a xenophobic attack, but that in, in sheltering that person or preventing that attack, I refuse to shelter an ideology that's masquerading as my religion when it's really seeking totalitarian ambitions and gaining it in some places. Uh, Cantor, we've, I've seen you many times on CNN and where you speak very bravely against jihad and uh, you travel all over the world. You're in Israel at the Technion. You are a sleep physician, a foremost sleep physician. <clears throat> and I'm interested to know when you get the time to sleep. <laughs> That's a nice question. So I'm fortunate because I'm a good sleeper. And um, I, I regard, because I'm a sleep disorder specialist, I regard sleep as a biological necessity. It's not a luxury. So I cancel social engagements. I don't return telephone calls. Um, that becomes a priority. I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm also very um, free in my schedule. Of course, I have my patients, but I don't have family responsibilities that a lot of women might have at my stage. And so I can do with less sleep for a couple of nights, and then some nights I will go to sleep at uh, 7 o'clock. But that, that's not really uh, my concern. And I sleep mostly with a very clear conscience. Uh, because I feel I'm spending my time uh, purposefully, and I think that benefits me too. Thank you.